Hello everybody, a uh, very very good evening and uh, welcome to Study IQ IAS English. Myself Abhishek Singh and uh, today we are going to learn about the Delhi Sultanate. That Delhi Sultanate about which we keep on uh, listening a lot. Most of us have our own perceptions about uh, this era of the history but very few among us are actually aware about the real values and the real contributions of the Delhi Sultanate. So, this lecture will be the overall summary of the various dynasties. It will be covered up uh, in the several parts, particularly today's first part that will cover a general introduction about the various dynasties of Delhi Sultanate and a specific overview of the ruling period of few earlier rulers of Delhi Sultanate, particularly the rulers of uh, Mamluk or the slave dynasty. So, I hope that everybody is uh, ready for the lecture. So, let us get started with the lecture. But before proceeding, let me just tell you about a very interesting thing. Basically, Study IQ IAS is offering the UPSC IAS Live New Foundation P2I Batch 1. This batch is uh, having a unique feature that it will be available for a single source preparation solution from prelims up to the interview but in three distinct parts like uh, there will be the silver and the gold and the platinum subscriptions basically available as per the varying durations of the 18 months, 30 month and 42 months validity will be there. So, it is a great opportunity for all the students who are looking forward for a one and a half year program or for a two and a half years program or for a three year and more than that, three plus years. So, basically the undergraduate students as well as the graduate or working students, they can target the different batches as per their convenience depending upon that. There is the different cost as well, but this cost is actually discounted cost. If you are using my code ASR live, then you are going to avail this. Right, we will talk about the various features, etc. But at the end of the session, so let us proceed to the topic directly. The topic is basically, as I told you, the Delhi Sultanate, first part. Okay. So, basically, why are we calling it as the Delhi Sultanate? This is also a good question in itself. All right. For example, suppose how would you react if I tell you that uh, Kutubuddin Abak? the first ruler in Delhi Sultanate. His capital was not in Delhi, but the capital was in Lahore initially. Iltutmish was the one who started ruling from Delhi. But later on, I would, uh, I think uh, you all would be aware or if you are not, then you should be aware that Delhi became the cultural, political, economic and the socio-cultural center of the entire Islamic world. There is a huge story behind it. There is a large, you know, big story behind it. What is that story? Let me just tell you a very important thing. Now, guys, have a look on this particular map. You will uh, understand complete story. This particular map shows that uh, the empire of Muhammad Ghori, okay, empire of Muhammad Ghori and uh, let me tell you that in 1203 AD, what happened? In 1203 AD, Muhammad Ghori lost a battle, he lost a battle against the Khwarizmi dynasty, against the Khwarizmi dynasty of Persia, okay everyone? So, when he lost the battle, what was the general consequence? The general consequence was that this area, which was uh, far away from his uh, kingdom, far away from his kingdom, all these areas, they started disintegrating. They started getting away from the control of Muhammad Ghori and particularly his representatives in India. Therefore, what will happen? The most 
notable incident will be taking place in 1206 when Muhammad Ghori will be returning back to India for a final time to punish the Khokar tribes of Punjab that particular area here right Lahore and the western parts of uh, Lahore region basically Khokar tribes will be there and uh, Ghori will be trying to punish them however some of them some of them would be uh, rebellious enough and they would be killing Muhammad Ghori in 1206 okay so the story of Muhammad Ghori that was over why was that over because let me tell you I think you might be able to recall from the previous lecture that Muhammad Ghori was basically a representative of his elder brother Gayasuddin and that Gayasuddin he was actually expanding towards the northwestern part of the empire and Muhammad Ghori was expanding his kingdom towards the southeastern part that is towards the India however when Ghori got killed then the expansion in India now became a question mark because there were several claimants several challengers who had declared that this is now their territory the Gurids have no claim as such some of you might be thinking that sir we have studied that all these people the names of whom uh, are written here all these were the slaves of Muhammad Ghori yes of course you are right but a typical Islamic jurisprudence that does not allow any slave to be the successor of Sultan that is why these slaves had they have actually entrusted their faith among the right on their sultans and therefore those sultans most of them they used to enter into the matrimonial relations with their slaves for example if I'm talking about uh, Iltutmish or even Abak, Abak, he had a right, he had the enslavement of Muhammad Ghori, whereas Iltutmish, he had the enslavement of Qutbuddin Abak. But both of them, they were related through the matrimonial alliances also. I think most of you must be aware that Muhammad Ghori had, right, Muhammad Ghori. He had no children, okay, he had no children and therefore his kingdom could not have a legitimate successor. Therefore, there was the claim made by several people including these four people as well. Qutbuddin Abak, he claimed for the portion of, uh, right, portion of the Indian parts of the Gurid Empire like the areas of Delhi and nearby regions of the Gangetic Plains. There was Tazuddin Yaldoz. Right? Tazuddin Yaldoz basically claimed the areas nearby Ghazni. Okay. And then there was uh, Nasiruddin Kubacha or Malik Nasiruddin Kubacha. He was the one who claimed the areas of Sindh, Multan, etc. Okay. Sindh, Multan, etc. And then there was in fact there were two people in bengal first of all ali mardan was there and later on iwas right iwas would be there right iwas muhammad iwas would be there they will be claiming the bengal as their sovereign territory now when we talk about this much of the you know fragmentation in the gurid empire then the attainment of a uh, imperial status by the successors of Gori in Delhi that itself become a very commendable achievement very commendable achievement right everyone so that is why the establishment of the Delhi Sultanate is not a direct outcome is not a direct outcome of the Gurid invasion but it was the outcome of uh, several incidents number one right this type of question could be the part of your mains examination so make it sure that you are able to understand and you are able to listen these things very carefully so suppose what is uh, what is the heading here that is the establishment of uh, delhi sultanate 
ओके एस्टैब्लिशमेंट ऑफ डेली सल्तनत सल्तनत वॉज द आउटकम ऑफ वॉज द आउटकम ऑफ मल्टीपल इंस्टेंसेस और इंसिडेंट्स मल्टीपल इंसिडेंट्स ओके डायरेक्ट इंसिडेंट्स ऑफ कोर्स द इन्वेजन ऑफ मोहम्मद गोरी और घुरिड इन्वेजन हाउ एवर द अदर इंसिडेंट्स दैट वुड बी दैट दोज वुड बी द डिक्लेरेशन डिक्लेरेशन ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंस बाय नेटिव एंड नेटिव एंड सेंट्रल एशियन कंटेंडर्स सेंट्रल एशियन कंटेंडर्स आफ्टर डेथ ऑफ गोरी आफ्टर डेथ ऑफ गोरी एंड द लास्ट पॉइंट वुड बी दैट इट वॉज ऑल्सो द आउटकम ऑल्सो द आउटकम ऑफ the seizures the seizures of uh, central asian expansion due to khwarizmi due to khwarizmi dynasty so guys i think most of you will agree to this point that the turks they could have taken the route of the expansion further in the northwest had the khwarizmi empire not checked them had they not started expansion of their own instead of allowing the turk expansion in south in the north western central asia so this is the basic reason because of which they could not expand towards the northwest and that is why their focus was the turks focus was towards india and this is why they emphasized more and more upon looting of the wealth upon destruction of the art and architecture and upon settlement of the in fact permanent character in the north western parts of india and further towards the gangetic plains also all right everyone so i hope that it is absolutely clear to all of you that what were the circumstances during the death of muhammad ghori and uh, how did those circumstances lead the path of establishment of delhi sultanat right everyone now let us understand about uh, the rise of the mamluk sultans right mamluk sultans the literal meaning of mamluk that is a slave in fact in this entire dynasty the rulers one after the other they will be either the slaves of the predecessing ruler or the successors in the family or in the house of the slave rulers for example qutbuddin abak who was the slave of muhammad gori he was followed by his son later on his son was replaced by iltutmish who himself was a slave of qutbuddin abak as well as the son in law of qutbuddin abak after him there were the contenders coming from the family the immediate family of iltutmish his own son and daughter and grandsons etc for example ruknuddin firoz shah razia sultan she was the only female sovereign in the entire medieval history of india from the delhi sultanate okay after her there was the there were two brothers in fact namely uh i think uh, yes there was muizuddin bairam shah and then after him after muizuddin bairam shah there was alauddin masood shah after alauddin masood shah then we will have the nasiruddin mahmud or nasiruddin muhammad shah okay and after that it will be balban so balban again he will be a different ruler from the different dynasty but once again he will be a slave of the predecessing dynasty so overall whenever i am slay, uh, i am saying that uh, slave dynasty is there all right everyone 
So remember the point that slave dynasty consisted of the three different dynasties, namely the Qutbi dynasty, then uh, Shamshi Albari, okay, Shamshi Albari dynasty, and Shamshi Balbani dynasty. Okay, Shamshi Balbani dynasty. So, Kutbi dynasty, it had only Kutbuddin Abak and uh, Aram Shah, whereas uh, Shamshi Albari dynasty, it had uh, Iltutmish, okay, it had uh, Ruknuddin Firoz Shah, Razia Sultan, it had uh, Muizuddin Bahram Shah, Alauddin Mashud Shah, right, and Nasiruddin Mahmud. Okay, Nasiruddin Mahmud. Then Shamshai Balbani dynasty, it had Gayasuddin Balban, Kakbad, okay, Kakbad, and Kaimurs, and Kaimurs. So different rulers were there. And uh, all of them collectively, they were known as the slave dynasty, but they belonged to the distinctive dynasties during their period. All right, everyone. So, moving further, let us understand about uh, the different rulers in detail. So, first of all, we will try to understand about Kutbuddin Abak, who was regarded as the first ruler or the immediate successor of the Muhammad Ghori's reign in northwestern India. However, let me tell you a very clear thing that neither Muhammad Ghori nor Qutbuddin Abak, both of them, they did not take the title of Sultan of uh, Hindustan or Sultan of India or Sultan of Delhi Sultanate. No such titles were taken by either, right, by neither Ghori nor by Qutbuddin Abak. And what is the reason behind it? Basically, Ghori was considering his elder brother Gayasuddin as his sovereign and Qutbuddin Abak was considering Muhammad Ghori as his sovereign and even after death of Ghori, Qutbuddin Abak, he was not liberated from the enslavery, from the enslavement. Therefore, as per the Islamic rule, he could not succeed officially to any type of sultanate, any type of throne. So that's why Qutbuddin Abak is not regarded as a legitimate sultan, despite there are certain historians who claim that he had received uh, right, affirmation from the Khalifa or the Caliph, but there are hardly any such evidences which, you know, which provide the concrete fact in this regard. So at least Satish Chandra does not regard Qutbuddin Abak or Professor K. A. Niz K. A. S. Nizami or uh, Muhammad Habib, all these historians, they do not regard Qutbuddin Abak as a legitimate Sultan of Delhi Sultanate in the truest sense. Got it everybody? However, still we cannot snatch away the four years of duration which he ruled as a Sultan or at least in the position of a sultan, right? So his tenure lasted for four years only, but in those four years, I should say that he handled the Delhi Sultanate and uh, challenges pertaining to that quite efficiently, quite efficiently, I should say. For example, the first question itself, the first challenge itself in front of his rule, that was his question of sovereignty. Do you know that? When uh, there was the death of Muhammad Ghori in 1206, as I told you, the distinct parts of his empire were inherited by the different slaves of Ghori. Someone else in Ghazni, someone others in uh, Multan and Sindh, someone else in uh, Lahore and Delhi, and someone else in Bengal. And all of them, they extended their claims of sovereignty. However, Abak was the most humble among all of them and he did not resist as such any claims coming from the, any quarter of his empire, Gurid empire. Rather, 
he accepted the robe and uh, the official letter right the robe official letter and a seal which was received from where received from tazuddin yaldoz of gajni because yaldoz claimed that gajni was the official seat the official capital of the empire so that is why if i am succeeding in this place i should be considered as the legitimate successor of muhammad gori so abak did not resist this abak he accepted this readily without offering any resistance so his thinking was that basically he wanted to avoid any sort of conflicts as such okay everyone yes he was not exactly you know, exactly affirmative towards nasiruddin kubacha but definitely he was more assertive more affirmative towards tajuddin yaldoz because there was a connection still a connection with gazni okay everyone but somehow by acceptance of this robe and the royal seal he completely spared the young delhi sultanat in getting into the indulged or getting into indulged into any sort of any type any type of fights with the yaldoz or with any other contemporary claimant so we can say that we can say that he completely avoided the question of his sovereignty or the validation of his rule was even not granted but still he carried on the administration without seeking for any validation either from the caliph or from gazni okay and therefore he made the ad hoc arrangements he did not make any permanent administrative reform or uh, any permanent administrative decisions as such he simply considered all the nobles as equivalents considered all the stakeholders of the early sultanate as the equal equal power sharers and did not even try did not even try to establish anything new in the system because he did not have that much of uh, capability or even that much of a scope as such right because many people want agree to the point of the capability however in history we don't deal in the emotions right we deal on the facts and therefore we don't have any such evidences where we can say that uh, abak was trying something concrete some great reformation in the administration nothing sort of that nothing okay apart from that we also witness the growing uprisings in his period in fact it was during the period of qutbuddin abak when the rajputana region of uh, rarthambore jalaun hamirpur and uh, ajaygarh or even the areas of uh, eastern southern rajasthan areas of bundelkhand areas of uh, you know bayana all these were getting liberated one after the other not only that iwaz khan in bengal he was claiming his throne in uh, bengal and bihar both as a sovereign ruler okay similarly nasiruddin similarly yaldoz all of them they were the claimants of the sovereignty despite the fact that iltut uh, that uh, abak was covering or ruling the largest area among all of them that did not matter to all of them okay so uprisings were quite numerous however when we talk about the contributions of uh, qutbuddin abak it is well known fact that abak was called as lakh baksh due to his due to his generous character generous behavior however being generous does not mean the person is a good administrator also so abak was not a great administrator in that case neither did he try nor did he has the time to do so unfortunately while playing a game called chaugan okay a game called as chaugan similar to modern polo okay modern day polo so this game actually resulted into the death of qutbuddin abak while falling right falling off the horse the two things which are worth remembering about him that is he was responsible behind the destruction of uh, 
सेवन हंड्रेड प्लस टेम्पल्स इन द कुतुब कॉम्प्लेक्स एरिया एज इट इज क्लेम्ड एंड आउट ऑफ दोज डिब्रीज ही कंस्ट्रक्टेड अ मॉस्क कॉल्ड एज द कुवतुल इस्लाम विच इज द वट इज द नेम ऑफ दैट मॉस्क कुवतुल इस्लाम ओके that is located in delhi another mosque called as a adhai din ka jhopda that was constructed in ajmer all right it is said that uh, abak had destroyed a pre existing sanskrit mahavidyalay and a pre existing vishnu temple to construct this uh, structure right so whatever temples were there like jain temple vishnu temple or sanskrit schools they were all destroyed and the remnants of which or the debris of which were used in the construction of these monuments however it appears that these monuments were simply simply uh, face lifted they were not repaired or they were not reconstructed completely rather they were simply face lifted face lifting is what face lifting is basically suppose when you simply uh, desecrate the front of the building or you simply remove the idols from there you remove the front of the building and then you simply make a new structure in the front so that it appears from outside like a new building but when you enter inside you will find that there are the pillars which are still intact there are the internal roofs or the works which are still carrying the symbols related to the contemporary temple architecture so all those things were there the people may ask the question that the reason behind the temple destruction what could be the reason behind it basically two reasons worked right two primary reasons worked in the temple destruction the one reason that would be <laughs> reasons behind uh, temple destruction okay number 1 socio cultural and uh, number 2 economic and political okay so when i say socio cultural reasons then what does it mean it means that it means that basically the factor of religion was responsible for it where the rulers used to inherit the titles or take the titles like butashikan or the titles like gazi which means the one who participates in the holy religious war gazi butashikan means the one who destroys the temples the idols particularly the idols but means idol okay so these used to instill a feel a feel of a uh, courage confidence among those who were less achievers that means those who could not achieve much by other means they used to you know just show off their achievements in the form of religious accomplishments in the form of the fulfillment uh, fulfillment of the cultural targets either through the conversions or through the enforced uh, acceptance of islam or through the destruction of the statues or the temples etc so that was one of the reasons of course socio cultural second right second that is the economic and political reason that is a more concrete and more justified fact for example mostly all the temples they had the immense wealth depositions because of the patronage by the ruler right ruler of the area of course this was the medieval period vassal system prevailed and we all are aware that in the feudal system or the vassalage system the wealth is concentrated in only few hands and those few hands they were supporting the temple construction they were supporting the architectural growth therefore a lot of wealth was invested in the temple construction making them as the display of the valor and the grandeur of the ruler 
and second thing making them as the epicenter of the cultural political academic and and economic activities in their specific locality so it is like it is like destroying the entire epicenter of the socio cultural political and economic spectrum of life of the people that's why the destruction of the temples it served various purposes not only the political demoralization or political uh, you can say loss of morals or economic benefit to the rulers or to the invaders but also the complete destruction of the epicenter of the contemporary society contemporary polity and contemporary eco economy okay everyone so these are the factors which led to the temple destruction now moving further to the rule of uh, shamsuddin iltutmish okay everybody shamsuddin iltutmish who was the son in law of uh, qutbuddin abak he did not immediately succeed the death of abak rather he had to fight and contest against the lazy son of uh, qutbuddin abak whose name was aram shah basically aram shah as his name suggests that he was not a very energetic and a young fellow at such he was young of course but he was not very energetic not very enthusiastic in order to expand the imperial uh, sway of uh, delhi sultanate whereas uh, iltutmish he was more serious more dedicated and therefore iltutmish was uh, supported by the nobility in the court and in sub in the lieu of that support iltutmish will be giving the rewards to the nobility and what will be that reward we will talk about it but uh, despite whatever reward whatever conditions or whatever conspiracies iltutmish had to do in order to become the sultan still he is regarded in very high reverence very high reverence as the real founder of the delhi sultanate and what is the reason behind it why is iltutmish known as the real founder of delhi sultanate so we have quite a few quite a few important reasons but let us have a look upon the few significant or few selected reasons like he tackled the political and right political instability and challenges now what is the meaning of this so called political instability and the challenges okay everyone so here when i am saying that political instability and the challenges all right everybody which type of political instability i am talking about do you remember the rajput rebellions which were taking place during the period of qutbuddin uh, abak they were completely resolved be it rathambor be it bayana be it jalon be it uh, kalinjar anywhere almost the entire southeastern part of rajasthan entire northern parts of uh, madhya pradesh and the western parts of and southern parts of south western parts of uttar pradesh that entire area was quenched properly it was quenched properly then he also settled the scores with tajuddin yaldoz okay who was not only defeated but also captured as a prisoner and uh, malik nasiruddin kubacha malik nasiruddin kubacha he was killed okay he was killed so both the major challengers they were completely eliminated from the path then uh, he also defeated the claims of ali mardan and iwaz khan ali mardan and iwaz khan 
this Iwaz Khan, right? He was actually followed by he was actually followed by a person named as Ilyas. Okay, a person named as Ilyas Beg who became Sultan Gayasuddin, right? Sultan Gayasuddin of Bengal. And uh, even he was also, right, even he was also defeated by son of El Tutmish. Okay, everyone. So we can say that be it the Rajput challenge, be it the challenge of the fellow Afghans, Turks, fellow Turks, or be it the challenge of uh, Bengal independence rulers, right? Bengal's independent rulers, all of them were completely devastated. They were totally eliminated in the form of a threat. And Iltutmish established a peaceful, strong, and stable kingdom free from any such anomalies which existed during the period of Qutbuddin Abak. Number one, and this is probably the biggest reason behind it. Okay. Now, second most important aspect of the political instability. Remember the thing. Guys, 1200 and uh, 18, I would say, 1218 or 1219. This would be the time period during which the Khwarizmi Empire would be attacked by the Mongol ruler Chinggis Khan. Okay, so basically Khwarizm, right. Khwarizm that was invaded. Those who do not understand where is Khwarizm, Khwarizm is the modern day Persia and the areas in the further north and the northeast of that, including certain parts of Afghanistan, certain parts of Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, etc. etc. Okay. So Khwarizm was invaded by Mongol armies. Mongol armies, and uh, it was completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. And that was the year, that was the year. 1220-1221 when Prince of Khwarizm, okay, Prince of Khwarizm, whose name was uh, Jalaluddin Mangbarani, okay, Jalaluddin Mangbarani, he was actually asking for the shelter in the court of El Tutumish. However, El Tutumish completely denied to grant him any type of shelter under the wrath of, because he just wanted to avoid the wrath of uh, Chinggis Khan. And that is how he was able to safeguard a nascent Delhi Sultanate in its uh, very young age itself from the wrath of mighty Chinggis Khan. Because it's a well-known fact that wherever he attacked, that city was completely, completely ravaged and uh, not only that the city went behind hundreds of years as far as the civilizational growth was concerned okay so that's why we can say that the biggest contribution in the political stability that was uh, granted or given by el tutmish that was in the form of the political asylum denial the denial of political asylum to prince Jalaluddin Mangbarani of the Khwarizmi Empire. Okay, everyone. Now, talking about uh, the other factors. So, I hope this is the this is absolutely clear to all of you. Yes, everyone. Now, talking about the other factors, he revamped the bureaucracy and administration. Revamped the bureaucracy and administration of the Delhi Sultanate. How did he do that? Let us have a look on uh, that. Okay. So, as far as the administration and bureaucracy was concerned, I hope that you all remember that uh, El Tutumish was supported by the clergy as well as the court nobles when he claimed the succession to the throne of Delhi Sultanate, even when the son of 
Abak, Aram Shah, he was ruling. So he had re decided to reward these uh, people on, in the court. So he introduced a system of land revenue assignment. Okay, land revenue assignment that was called as uh, ikta ikta dari okay in which ikta was basically the unit of the unit of uh, land revenue okay and mukti mukti or wali was the person in charge person in charge of the revenue collection okay everyone the person in charge of the revenue collection now what was the scenario the basically if this is the empire okay if this is the empire this much of the area is reserved for the center that is uh, reserved for sultan so c is basically the reserved area or the reserved land revenue land revenue collection area for sultan okay this area was known as khalsa this area was known as Khalisa. Whereas the uh, rest of the areas, right, rest of the areas, they were called as Iktas. Ikta. Ikta was basically the remaining, remaining area under land revenue land revenue assignment assignment to be distributed among the officials so guys remember the fact that uh, this entire area it is like you know it is like segregation of the area under control under the control for the purpose of revenue collection directly under Sultan and the area granted to the trustworthy officers of the Sultan. Okay, everyone. So, those areas which were entrusted to the officials faithful to Sultan or favorite of Sultan, those areas were called as Ikta. So, those areas were called as Ikta. For example, they were subsequently divided into the various subparts. Okay, various subparts, and all of them were called as ikta. So it is like ikta 1, ikta 2, ikta 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Total, there were like this is just an example that in this particular map there are total 11 iktas, and one particular area which is called as khalisa, that area in included the total land directly under the revenue collection assignment of the emperor himself, sultan himself. So, this is how the administrative system was organized where the sultanat that was uh, followed by ikta, that was uh, followed by shik, followed by pargana, and followed by Mauja. Mauja is basically village, Pargana is a sub-district or sometimes block, Shik is a district, Ikta is basically a province and Sultanat is basically state, you know, state or country. Okay, so this is how the entire administrative setup that was designed by Iltutmish. And for the purpose of uh, distribution of the Ikta, 
Iltutmish had designated, right, designated a group of uh, 40 nobles, okay, 40 Turk nobles, whose group was known as Chalisa or Chahalgani, okay, Chahalgani. Okay, everyone. So, this Chalisa or the Forties or Chahalgani, basically Chahalgani, a Turk, that means the group of 40 Turk nobles. This is how they, that he used to name it. And among this 40 people, there were all the major officials, all the major iktadars, all the major commanders and the governors of the area. Every important official belonged to this special league of 40, this special league of 40 people. All right, everyone. So this is how he introduced the administrative reforms, etc. Now moving further, he did not just introduce these administrative reforms, but also he was the one who was behind the stable political and economic system also in our country. Okay, everyone. And why are we saying that? What type of uh, special system did he introduce? Actually, he was the one who had introduced the coins, the coinage system, the, you can say, currency system, taxation system of Delhi Sultanate, administrative system of Delhi Sultanate, that all credit goes to Iltutmish only. Okay, everyone. So, not only the administrative system, but also the currency system and the taxation system, everything was introduced by Iltutmish in Delhi Sultanate. For example, if we talk about the taxation system, some of you might have heard or might not have heard Fawazil. What is a Fawazil? Fawazil was basically the tax which was deposited by the Iktadars after the deduction of their local expenditures in the maintenance of ikta okay the additional revenue collected by the iktadars which was left out of uh, the expenditure and maintenance of ikta then it was called as fawazil this fawazil was the revenue portion to be deposited by the iktadar in the central treasury that is fawazil okay apart from that the regularization of the taxes on the horses, on the grazing animals, on the houses, all these things, they were done by El Tutumish. Okay? Apart from that, we all should know, right, about the some basic taxes, uh, taxation systems in Islamic rule. But we will understand about the nature of the administration and the nature of the rule of Delhi Sultanate in subsequent lectures, not in today's lecture, okay? The coins behind me, you can see this is a 3.69 grams, the weight is just that much and diameter is 13.70 millimeter. This is basically the coin called as Jital, called as Jital, okay? It was a copper coin. All right, everyone. Then we have uh, another coin called as Taka, called as Taka. So Taka, this particular image is the coin of uh, Gayasuddin Balban, okay, Sultan Gayasuddin Balban of Delhi Sultanate. However, similar, exactly similar type of uh, Taka that was uh, started by Iltutmish, purely Arabic inscriptions were there, okay, and this inscriptions actually they were the writings of the name of the Sultan and also on the leeward side there was the Khutbah in the name of the Caliph. Okay, everyone. So, with the name and the title of Sultan along with Khutbah, they were used to, they used to be minted on the coin itself and this was a silver coin called as a Taka. Okay, everyone. Silver coin called as Taka. And it had a weight of approximately 10.8 grams. Okay, 10.8 grams. Okay, everyone. So, this is exactly 
what was contributed by Gayasuddin Balban and why, sorry, contributed by uh, El Tutmish and why is he called as the real founder of the Delhi Sultanate. But after him, when he declared that not his sons but uh, his daughter Razia should be made the successor, this resulted into a lot of furor, lot of uh, unrest and reactions coming all along from the group of those 40 nobles called as Chalisa or the Chahalgani. Okay. So, this Chahalgani was basically, it, it was having Balban also, it was having a, you can say even, right, even uh, Altunia was there, Malik Altunia, you might have heard the name. So, these all people, they were taking the side of Ruknuddin Firoj Shah. Ruknuddin Firoj Shah, he was the son of uh, El Tutmish, who thought that it is his legitimate right to become the next Sultan. And naturally, because he was a male, he was a son of course, even though the eldest son of El Tutmish, he had died in the facing of a Mongol incursion. However, his son Ruknuddin Firoj Shah still wanted to claim the throne more than Razia because he was a he was a man, that's why. Even the nobles were not ready to accept the entitlement of a female in that era, back in 13th century. So that is why there were a lot of struggles going on. And from the period of 1236 to 1246, there will be three rulers, namely, in fact, four rulers, right, namely, Ruknuddin, okay, Ruknuddin, Firoj Shah, then there will be Razia, then there will be, right, Muizuddin, Bahram Shah, okay, Bahram Shah, and then there will be Alauddin Mashud. Right. So, this Ruknuddin Firoj, he will be just ruling for few months. Razia will be ruling for uh, 1236 to 1240, four, almost four years, three and a half years. Then uh, Muizuddin Bahram Shah will be ruling only for uh, 40 to 42, okay. And for remaining four years, 42 to 46. It will be the rule of Alauddin Masood Shah. However, this entire period or entire decade, that will be the decade of uh, conflicts, internal fights and the unrests in the Delhi Sultanate. Therefore, what is more important to understand that uh, basically the rise of female sovereign that exposed the that exposed the contemporary liberalism okay what does that mean actually when we talk about the contemporary liberalism which means that uh, we are talking about the so called liberal ideas of the hanafi school of islam of which the Turks were the followers, the so-called liberal ideas of the Sufis, of whom, of whom the Dili Sultans were the followers. But when we talk about uh, the rise of Razia, it is very difficult to understand that why were these Sufis or why were these uh, Hanafi scholars unable to support the claim of Razia, because it was something unprecedented it never ever had happened in the past when a sovereign had taken oath as a sultan. People may give the claims to uh, the Cleopatra or uh, Cleopatra of uh, Egypt or people may lay the claims to certain other rulers related to Islam or Judaism. But remember, there used to be the rulers who were females of course, but none of them had ever tried to claim sovereignty. They all ruled as the representative of the minor son 
not as the sovereign rulers. On the other hand, Razia was trying to assert her own sovereignty and that was the biggest problem and that is why she was continuously subjected to the conspiracies primarily hatched by their right by the uh, 40 nobles or the group of 40s Chahalgani and the leading among them was Malik Altunia okay Malik Altunia in fact there is a story also there is a story also that uh, ra this Razia right she was in the uh, in, in, in fact I would not say the affair but I would say that she was in a very close relations very cl close relation with one of the African slave and uh, in fact that African slave was given the title of uh, Amir A. Aknur that means the in charge of Astabal. However, that did not go down well for the nobility as they thought that it would be extremely disgraceful to accept uh, an Ethiop Ethiopian noble at such a high level. So that's why what happened? The nobles revolted and both Razia as well as uh, her African slave both were you know, defeated in the battle near modern Fatehgarh or modern uh, Sarhind in Punjab and later on when Razia was uh, imprisoned in that place Razia she fell in love with Malik Altunia the governor of uh, uh, Sarhind and uh, she got married with him okay both of them got married and later on they combinedly laid their claim to the throne but they were defeated by uh, defeated by the successors who were claiming who were claiming the rightful succession of uh, Bahram Shah and who were those supporters once again the 40 nobles only so we can say that the group of 40 nobles that never led right, never let the enthronement of Razia become a successful venture all right everyone so in the second part tomorrow we will be talking about the rule of Balban also we will try to understand about the administrative features of Delhi Sultanate and we will also try to understand about the uh, art and architecture and cultural consequences of Delhi Sultanate's first half in the third part. Till then let me just tell you some features related to the P2I batches in which we are actually offering not just a, a comprehensive syllabus coverage but also we are offering you a dedicated mentorship program along with that handwritten notes along with that the success in prelims like a dedicated program for exclusively covering the prelims and success in mains the dedicated program for succeeding in the mains pro uh, right aspect of the examination all these are the part of this offering moreover you will also get the dedicated books for uh, the complete holistic and one-stop preparation for the entire civil services in fact when you are able to clear the preliminary stage under this program you will be called to our campus in Delhi NCR and we will offer you the mains residential program exactly in simple and short the offline coaching of study IQ that will be provided to you by giving you the free stay and free food in Delhi NCR without charging extra penny nothing will be charged so it's a grand opportunity for any student who is pursuing a graduation or who is uh, just graduating or who is uh, looking for appearing in the 2025 year right, that examination anybody among them they can select the given validity durations and then it will be extremely useful program for them you can use my code ASR live when you want to join any specific batch all right Apart from that guys, uh, if you want the content etc, you can also join my telegram channel by scanning this QR code or simply by clicking on this particular link. Thank you so much for watching it. Take care, bye bye and Jai Hind.